Help give kids an extra life by donating today to help sick and injured children. Link in the description and pinned comment below. I swear to God, if they bring back East Howard in City of the Wolves, I am seriously gonna- When you think of the name Atari, what is it that comes to mind? For some people, it's the Atari 2600, one of the first commercially successful consoles. For others, it's the arcade classics that came before and after it. The early years of gaming were a time of adventure, and the arcades were like a treasure trove of new experiences. Kind of like exploring a dungeon looking for loot. And I've already talked about how Dungeons & Dragons has had an influence on video games. Two months ago, I talked about one attempt to bring the D&D experience to arcades in the form of the Tower of Druaga, but that was far from the only example. The arcade has plenty of games that tried to put their own take on the feeling of fantasy dungeon crawling, which brings us to the topic of today's video, the mystical quest from the vault of Atari games, Gauntlet. One of the first four-player dungeon crawlers, Gauntlet has a lasting legacy as an arcade classic, and we're going to cover this storied franchise today. Its highs, its lows, and its cheesy charm. Make sure you have enough food. And don't worry, you won't need to look up a guide this time. Now, it may be a bit confusing, but the Atari name has surprisingly gone through a lot of hands. In 1984, after the video game crash sent the industry to its first dark age in North America, the company got broken up. The Consumer Products Division was spun off into Atari Corporation, while the Coin-Op Division would be renamed Atari Games, later transferring the name and Coin-Op Division to a new company, jointly owned by Warner Communications and Namco. Now, Atari Games would go on to make several iconic arcade titles, including Gauntlet. The game was designed by Ed Logg, a designer at Atari. He based the game off of his son's experience playing Dungeons & Dragons, as well as another dungeon crawler called Dandy, which was released in 1983 for Atari 8-bit computers. In fact, the two games were so similar that the designer of Dandy, John Palovich, threatened a lawsuit after the release of the NES port of Gauntlet in 1987, which was settled before it ever went to court. Allegedly, Atari gave Palovich a Gauntlet cabinet. Heh, <laughs> imagine if every dispute was as easy to settle as that. Development of the arcade game took place between 1983 and 1985, with some of the most elaborate hardware that Atari had used to date. The game was originally going to be called Dungeons, but the name became legally unavailable in April of 1985, so they changed the name the following month. Gauntlet would release later in 1985, first in the UK in October, followed by the North American release in November. The Japanese release would come in February of 1986, published by Namco. So let's pop a quarter in the slot and start this baby up! The game's attract mode is lengthy, but has a lot to tell thee. Gauntlet is a top-down hack-and-slash that takes place in a seemingly endless dungeon. On each floor, thy objective is simple. Find the exit and proceed to the next floor. Actually, doing it on the other hand is not quite so easy. There's, well, a gauntlet of enemies and obstacles in thy path treasures to find, and tricky traps set up to throw thee off thy game. Okay, the old English accent isn't working for me. There are four characters designated by their class, and on the original four-player cabinet, each class was assigned a player number on the cabinet. You could choose your class in the two-player cabinet version, which was released in mid-1986. The four characters each had their own unique stats and playstyle. Thor, the warrior, is the strongest in close-quarter combat, but his magic sucks. Thyra, the Valkyrie, has the strongest armor, but her magic and attack power aren't quite as good. Merlin, the wizard, is... well, I don't even think I need to say it. Wait. What's that? I'm contractually obligated to say it? Alright. Yeah, he has the strongest magic power both with potions and shot power, but physical power? Don't bother. Finally, we have Questor the Elf, who's the fastest of the bunch and has decent magic, but isn't the best at fighting. So if you're playing alone, you'll have to pick which character fits your playstyle, and if you're playing with friends, well, so much the better. Especially considering having to fight through the sheer volume of monsters in the dungeons, enemies spawn from generators which you must attack in order to destroy, and each enemy type spawns from a different type of generator, so fighting through enemies to get to the generators is a priority. Ghosts will try to ram you and will disappear if successful, and are weak to shots but immune to melee attacks. Grunts will fight you up close and are vulnerable to both shots and melee attacks. Lobbers are also vulnerable to both types of attacks, but shoot instead of fight close. 
Demons are a kind of combination of grunts and lovers in terms of attacks. Sorcerers can turn invisible to avoid your attacks, and thieves steal from the player with the most treasure. And finally, there's death. And insert Puss in Boots line right about here. Death can only be destroyed by magic potions, so you'd better hope you have at least one stocked up. Actually, there's plenty of items you'll want to stock up on. There's, of course, treasure, which gives you 100 points a chest, which means that the occasional treasure room could seriously boost your score. There are keys, which, well, if you don't know what they do, then I don't know what to tell you except... they open doors. There's an invisibility item which hides you from enemies and removes all aggro whatsoever from you, which, given the sheer number of enemies that can exist on screen, can only be a good thing. There's bomb potions, which can be stockpiled for activation with the magic button, and they affect every enemy on screen. There's various power potions, which increase your stats, and most importantly, is food, which increases your health. You'll need that most of all, because you'll lose health not only from enemies, but from just existing. Yeah, your health is on a timer, with you losing about one health per second. And once your health gets low, the in-game announcer will be absolutely sure to let you know it. Help me food badly. Wait, 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 don't shoot the- Remember, don't shoot food. Food. Well, if your health gets really low, you can insert another coin at any time, giving you the health that's indicated on the HUD, which is managed by the dip switch settings. Other players can jump in at any time as well to make things easier on everyone, provided you remember you share a common screen. By the way, your high scores are determined on a per-coin average to reward the more skilled players as opposed to those who just pump quarters into the machine. And having friends will help because there's also stuff like teleport tiles, breakable walls, traps that remove other certain walls, and the announcer that will chronicle your adventures the whole time. The announcer's voice was produced by a Texas Instruments TMS-5220C speech chip encoded by Earl Vickers, with the voice lines narrated by American filmmaker Ernie Vesalius. Those early synthesized voice clips are a big part of this game's charm, as is the rest of the presentation. The sprites are clean and distinct, and it's easy to tell what's what. The sound has a distinct twang to it that most Atari games titles of the era share. And as for the gameplay? It's tight and crisp with an emphasis on strategizing on the fly. It's important to work with your teammates to share food and items, as well as holding choke points to take out hordes of enemies in your way. It's what makes Gauntlet such a classic. And naturally, the game was a big success, both critically and financially. Critics gave Gauntlet high praise, naming it one of the best arcade games of all time. Some of its achievements include Game of the Year at the 1986 Golden Joystick Awards, and Most Innovative Video Game at the 1986 Amusement Players Association Players' Choice Awards. And it was a big seller as well. The AMOA listed Gauntlet as the highest-earning dedicated arcade cabinet in North America in 1986, selling over 7,800 units to arcades across the continent. It was also a big success in Japan for Namco, setting a record for earnings for an Atari cabinet. As such, it would be ported to numerous home computers, including MS-DOS, Mac, Commodore 64, the Sega Master System, and probably most obviously, the NES. However, Gauntlet on the NES was released exclusively in North America, having been released in 1988 by Tengen, which was Atari Games' consumer software division. Now this version is often seen as the definitive home version of the game, and there were a couple of notable changes. First of all, you could see the character's stats on the character screen. Also, there's an actual plot. The evil wizard Morak has stolen the sacred orb and hidden it within the gauntlet so that he could attack the people of Rendar with his evil magic. There were 100 rooms in this version, as opposed to who knows how many floors in the arcade original, and to reach the final floor, you needed to obtain the password, the parts of which were hidden in clue rooms throughout the game. And even then, you don't actually fight Morak. You fight a dragon who's guarding the sacred orb. There were quite a few other unique elements in this version of the game, including increasing your character's max HP by collecting treasure. Some of the new elements were taken from the sequel to the arcade original, making for an interesting combination. Speaking of which... Yes, to the surprise of nobody, Gauntlet did get a sequel in 1986. A significant expansion of the first game, Gauntlet 2 introduced the distinction of color characters, as multiple players could now select the same class. Also part of the game were new level designs, including levels which were rotated 90 degrees off of their original orientation. Other obstacles include movable walls, acid puddles, walls that contain items or enemies, force fields that drain health, tiles that can stun you, randomly moving walls, and monsters that can make you it. Which has nothing to do with monster clowns, and everything to do with drawing monster aggro until you touch someone else or reach the exit. As in, the real exit. There are fake exits now, too. 
Also, by completing special objectives, you can enter secret rooms full of items and treasure. Fun fact! Some of the levels and ideas in this game were the result of a contest from the first game. This game was also where the series' trademark main theme made its debut. Meanwhile, there were two third games in the franchise. Gauntlet, the third encounter, was developed by Epix for the Atari Lynx, which was basically setting it up for failure from the start considering how bad the Lynx bombed. Now, this game was published in 1990 by Atari Corporation, who had obtained the franchise license from Atari Games. While there were only 40 rooms in this game, there were now 8 total classes to choose from. Joining the Valkyrie and the Wizard were 6 new classes. The Samurai, the Punk Rocker, the Android, the Gunfighter, the Nerd, and the Pirate. Meanwhile, several home computers played host to Gauntlet 3 The Final Quest, which was developed by Tengen and published by US Gold in 1991. This game traded the traditional top-down perspective for a 3D-like isometric perspective. Joining the four original classes were a Lizard Man, a Rock Man, an Ice Man, and a Merman. The game's 40 levels took place over eight kingdoms, which weren't always straightforward. Sometimes you had to clear specific objectives to move forward, you'd get clues to help you at times, and sometimes you needed to decode combination locks using a physical code wheel that was packaged with the game. Honestly, was piracy really that bad even back then? Then there was Gauntlet 4 for the Genesis, published by Tengen in 1993 and developed by M2, who you may recognize from a few arcade compilations. This game contained a port of the arcade original, but also included a new quest mode, which included character leveling and item purchasing along with new levels and bosses, a multiplayer deathmatch battle mode, and a single player record mode. Following Gauntlet 4, the series lay dormant for the next five years, only to evolve to a new level in 1998 with the franchise's return to arcades, Gauntlet Legends. This would be the first to be published, or co-published in this case, by Midway Games, who was owned by the same company as Atari Games at the time. The story centers around the threat of the demon Scorn, who is summoned by the sinister wizard Garm. Only Scorn, being the ultimate evil, proves too powerful to control and drags the fool's soul to the underworld, also, he only had 12 of the 13 rune stones, so... And now Scorn has scattered the 13 rune stones across the four mystical realms. And now Garm's brother Sumner has summoned four brave heroes to defeat Scorn's guardians, retrieve the rune stones, and defeat Scorn himself. The four classes return, except that the elf had been replaced by the archer. As far as gameplay goes, this was the first big leap for the franchise. The core gameplay is still there, slaying monsters, destroying generators, collecting treasures, but this was Gauntlet's leap into 3D. Not only that, but journeying through the realms makes for much more diverse environments. Each realm has its own unique enemies, obstacles, and puzzles. And that means a lot of experience for your character to gain. Yep, you can level up in this game! And in the arcade version, your progress is saved by a password system, so you'd need to make sure you had a notebook that level-up system could improve your attributes as well as new abilities. Characters now had a chargeable turbo attack, which could recharge over time and damage a wide range of enemies, and at a certain level you could acquire a beast transformation. I wonder if this is where Capcom got the idea for Beast Out. Nah. Also, yes, I've heard the comparison between Sumner and Saruman from Lord of the Rings. Interestingly enough, each of the home ports had something different, including different stages. Of course, if you want the definitive version, you'd want the follow-up. Gauntlet Dark Legacy Initially released in arcades in 1999, with a direct port on PS2 in 2001, and GameCube and Xbox enhanced versions and even a Game Boy Advance version in 2002, Dark Legacy was a significant expansion. First off, four new classes, the Dwarf, the Knight, the Sorceress, and the Jester. And with them came four new realms with new levels to explore and conquer, two of said realms coming from the home ports of Legends. The gameplay expanded quite a bit as well. You can now combo with light and heavy attacks, initiate charging attacks to plow through enemies, strafe to deal with large groups, defend against enemy strikes, and in co-op mode you could use tag team specials. Combine that with all new level maps, items, and a new plot twist in which Scorn's essence corrupts Garm upon the demon's defeat for a whole new final boss, and there's a strong case for Dark Legacy being the definitive gauntlet experience. As long as it's not the GBA version, that version is crap. And what happened next? A host of sorrows. Seven sorrows to be exact. Gauntlet Seven Sorrows, released by Midway in 2005 for PlayStation 2 and Xbox, was meant to be the follow-up to Dark Legacy. It drew gamers in with what was meant to be an epic story in a faraway kingdom. 
the Emperor chose four immortal champions to be his protectors. However, he became jealous of his protectors, which made him a pawn for a great deception by his most trusted advisors, known as the Six. Of course, it's so obvious! The bad guys were ancient soups! Well, to be fair, that's not too far off. The heroes were nailed to a great tree, and the Six stole their powers and got transformed into demons. And now the Emperor, having realized too late the magnitude of his folly, has released the heroes in hopes that they could defeat the Six and undo the sorrows brought upon the land. Okay, this is trying way too hard to be serious. But it was 2005, what do you expect? Well, if you were expecting anything resembling the Legends duology or even the arcade originals, you'd be sorely disappointed. Only the original four characters were around. No unlockable or secret characters, no character customization, and they started out with just dull basic attacks. Characters were upgraded with combos and moves between levels this time instead of any sort of hub. Oh yeah, they got rid of the hub and by extension the ability to replay levels. Not that there was anything of value in those levels to make them worth replaying in the first place. There were only 16 levels in the game, much fewer than Legends, and these levels were more linear than a basic algebra equation. Oh, and most of the item types besides food and treasure were gone. So little in the way of variety in levels, enemies, gameplay. It was so basic you'd swear its favorite Pokemon was Charizard. Not to mention this game was so short overall that you could beat it in less than four hours! <laughs> Funny thing, this game was initially spearheaded by industry veterans Josh Sawyer and John Romero. Yes, that John Romero. The same one who helped create Doom and Quake, and also the same one who wanted to make you as bitch with Daikatana. Romero and Sawyer even created two new characters for the game, the Tragedian and the Lancer. But the two vets left Midway mere months before the game was complete, and the two original characters were left in the ditch along with the game's sales. So I guess, in a cosmic sort of way, Seven Sorrows was a fitting title for this game. And thus, the Gauntlet series would fall dormant. Midway filed for bankruptcy in 2009, going defunct in 2010. There was a reboot in the works for the Nintendo DS, being developed by Backbone Entertainment and being announced by Eidos Interactive in 2008. It was going to combine the classic gameplay, classes, and enemies of the original games with the leveling system of Legends and new graphics and several multiplayer modes. Unfortunately, the game ended up being unceremoniously cancelled, thus leaving the franchise in limbo once again. And then WB Games happened! As it turns out, following Midway's bankruptcy, the company's assets were purchased by Warner Brothers Interactive Entertainment. That included the rights to not only games like Mortal Kombat, but also the old Atari games franchises, including Gauntlet. And so, in 2014, Gauntlet was rebooted with a new game developed by Arrowhead Studios and released by WB Games for Windows. And at the time, only Windows. It was later re-released on Windows and PS4 as Gauntlet Slayer Edition, and... Well, it's not terrible, but it feels like a step between the Legend series and Seven Sorrows. On the one hand, it feels a lot better to play than Seven Sorrows, but at the same time, it feels bland in comparison to Dark Legacy. First off, the four classic classes return, plus the Necromancer as DLC, but they play significantly different from one another. It's not like the original, where the main difference between classes was the favorite stat, while the core gameplay was the same between them. And that can be a problem, because like in the original arcade game, only one player could use any given class. Meaning if someone takes your main, you'd be stuck playing a completely different playstyle. Which leads to another issue. Upgrading characters. Each character on your save file has their own gold count, and purchasing items is expensive. Meaning it feels like there's less of an incentive to try other characters. And taking damage is punishing. A single hit can take a quarter of your health. The fact that this is offset by the plentiful levels of food in the dungeons actually magnifies the issue here. Not to mention, the levels are not quite as unique as the varied realms of the Legends games, and the voice clips sound like a cheap attempt to replicate the charm of the original. That being said, if you can get a group together for co-op, that's when it's at its best. Working together has always been the crux of the Gauntlet series, and that's no different here. The Slayer Edition also adds an endless mode where you go through an endless stretch of floors until you collapse, so that adds a little replay value for grinding gold. And the presentation is pretty good, with atmospheric music and well-done graphics. So yeah, the attempt is there, but your enjoyment will probably depend on what kind of gauntlet you're looking for. And that's where Gauntlet has been left since then. 
At this point, you may as well look for a used copy of the Legends games, or a retro compilation for your gauntlet fix, or resorting to emulation. WB Games has shown no indication of wanting to keep Gauntlet going, and as cool as a new Gauntlet game would be on the surface, as things stand now, I kinda don't want it. The reason for that is pretty simple. The state of the gaming industry in general, and WB Games in particular. Seriously, when you take a look at how they handled games like Suicide Squad Kill the Spirits of Rocksteady, do you honestly trust this publisher to handle their other franchises with care, especially their less popular ones? If anything, the prospect of a new Gauntlet game under WB Games at this point would sound more like a threat, because it would more than likely be chock full of live service crap like battle passes, microtransactions for gold, and the worst thing of all, executive meddling. And yet, there remains the faintest ray of hope. A fan-made remake of Dark Legacy has been in development for some time, and there's probably some brilliant Gauntlet-inspired indie games out there. So for those who desire co-op questing and adventuring, take heart there's someone out there who has what you seek. Meanwhile, there are reports that Warner Brothers Discovery is looking to sell off their video game division. Only time will tell what'll happen from that, but if Toys for Bob can go indie, I see no reason why the studios under WB's banner can't do the same. Devs need agency badly. I'm the Quarter Guy, and until next time, the arcade is closed. You know, when Craig Council betrayed the Brewers for the Cubs, everyone thought the crew was going down. When the front office traded away their ace pitcher for a couple of relatively unknown players, everyone thought the Brewers were headed for disaster. Take a look at the standings, Chief. You call this disaster? The Brewers are doing just fine. Please don't let this age poorly. Next time, top 10 games that should have sucked, but didn't. It's game time! Hey everyone, QG here. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Feel free to check out my Twitter and my Twitch streams, and consider supporting me through Patreon, and donating to my Extra Life campaign to support Children's Wisconsin. Thanks for watching.